the British Mark IV tank. Most produced tank in history. We beat the Russians. We have a gun that's bigger than there. The Russians introduced the T-62. Guns were very scarce for new weapon program. Germans had 120 millimeter gun. Someone replaces Putin. I don't trust the idea of a raging change war. Hello, welcome to Mo Shao USA show. This is Tom Haber, developer assistance for neutralizing rockets and drones. He currently coaches teenager robotic teams. They met in the MIT Free Speech Alliance. Good morning, Mr. Haber. Morning, Dr. Liu. Today, we're going to talk about the M1 tank and its implications for Ukraine. In World War I, what happened was that the German line and the Allied force line dug into great trenches that extended all the way from the North Sea down to Switzerland. And so in between the two trench lines was no man's land. This used to be a forest, but after the two sides shot at each other for several years with artillery and machine guns, look at this. So they had to come up with a way to cross that area. Eventually, they came up with a contraption that looked like this. This is the British Mark IV tank. It wasn't quite good enough to actually cross the trenches, in most cases. <laughs> Here's an example of what could happen with that. So all of the hours began rapid development of new types of tanks. The Germans had the initially the Panzer and later on the Tiger tanks. This is a Tiger tank, which is a rather evolved tank. The initial Panzers were not nearly as formidable. They had 37 millimeter guns, the same as this French S-35 tank. But these are all in the period after World War I, but before World War II. The British had a cruiser tank and the Russians had a very successful tank, T-34. When we got into the war, we brought the M4 Sherman tank, shown here, with a 75 millimeter gun, which was a pretty good gun for that era. Towards the end, though, the Soviets decided that they needed a tank that could dominate the battlefield, that would be the king of the battlefield for years. And so they invented the T-54 tank with a 100 millimeter gun. This was the most produced tank in history. There were 100,000 of these tanks made, including all the various. So we were kind of in trouble. In 1948, the U.S. came out with the M48 Patton tank with a 90 millimeter gun, which was a pretty good tank, but probably not really sufficient to take on the T-54. So we got busy and we came up with a bigger gun. So here's the M60 tank, which was introduced by the U.S. in 1959 with a 105 millimeter gun. Aha, we got them. We beat the Russians. We have a gun that's bigger than theirs. Well, not so fast. In 1962, the Russians introduced the T-62 tank with a 115 millimeter gun. This was also very widely produced. Tens of thousands of these were produced. So once again, we were behind in the tank and tank gun competition, but things were about to get worse. In 1972, the Russians introduced the T-72 tank. This tank had a 125 millimeter gun and it could fire projectiles like this one. This is called a long rod kinetic energy penetrator. Just because it is so fast and so heavy and so long, it can go through the armor of any tank that was out there at the time. So what could we do? We needed something new, an MBT-70 tank, which was our first response. So what this did was to try to achieve a low profile by putting all three men in the turret. But what that meant was that when the turret turned, the driver had to be counter-rotated so that he would be facing forward and not lose track of which way the tank was going. So what this actually wound up doing was making the driver sick most of the time. So in the years after the Vietnam War, funds were very scarce for new weapon programs. Now, fortunately, three things came together in the 70s. The first was a way to overcome the shape charge. No tank of the day, not even the Russian tank, could defend against even these relatively small shape charges, much less larger anti-tank missiles. So fortunately, there was a development mostly by the Germans and English that was called Chobham armor or special armor. They break up the shape charge jet. So for the first time, we had an armor that was capable of defeating shape charges. So this was a big deal. The next thing that happened 
was the development of a much better material, both for armor and for our own long rod projectiles. It's called depleted uranium. With intensive metallurgy, they were able to turn it into a very strong, very tough, and especially very dense material, which is more than two and a half times the density of steel. So all of a sudden, we had great long rod penetrators that were actually superior to those of the Russians. So in conjunction with that, we designed the M1 tank to have a third innovation, and that is ammunition storage in a separate safe ammunition compartment. It has blowout panels on the top and on the sides so that the blast will vent through the top and sides and it will not kill the occupants of the tank. Fourth innovation was the Germans had a 120 millimeter gun and it was capable of firing the depleted uranium long rod ammunition that I just showed you. So in the M1A1, 120 millimeter gun was put on and to counter the Russian long rods, uh, depleted uranium plates were added to the armor of the M1A1. So this shows actually at M1A2, the U.S. is going to send 31 M1 tanks to Ukraine in 2024, but they won't have the DU armor or the DU ammunition because it's too hard to clean up and because the composition of the armor is still secret. The main purpose of our agreeing to supply 31 tanks is to get Germany to authorize 100 or 200 tanks, not all of them their own, in this year, hopefully in time for the anticipated spring offensive. But we need to realize that Russia already has over 1,000 tanks in Ukraine and that anti-tank missiles and mines have continued development and have high effectiveness. And here, just for example, is a Russian tank that was hit by something, probably a javelin, and the ammunition blew up and killed all the people inside of it. And this has happened over 1,000 times in Ukraine. So 31 tanks in 2024 are not going to make a big difference to Ukraine. The 100 or 200 tanks that the Germans may send this year could have some effect. What would really be useful would be the most modern version of the M1, which has on it a system called Trophy that was developed by the Israelis, a little startup impetus by myself. And what Trophy does it's on several hundred U.S. tanks now, and Trophy has a radar that detects an incoming anti-tank missile, and then it tracks it to make sure that it is a missile, and that it is aimed at this tank. If it is, then it shoots out a shotgun-style blast and knocks the missile down before it can impact and destroys the missile. So that would be the most useful thing that we could provide to Ukraine, but it's very unlikely that we're going to do so. That's it for the M1 and tank warfare. Okay. I really hope the war and this year don't extend oh. to 2024. We want a peace talk. Yes, I agree with you entirely, but the only way that I can see the war ending anytime soon is if someone replaces Putin. Actually, I don't trust the, the idea of a region change war. I, I guess Russia probably is the same thing. If they saw we are going to uh, decline and weak, they will have more putting like dictators came out. Even we get rid of one, there's another one. So the, the fundamental thing is strengthen our democracy and uh, build our power on the domestic side. You're right. He would just be replaced with another dictator. But the new dictator would almost certainly take a different approach regarding Ukraine, because the only reason why Putin would be replaced would be if the powers that be in Russia decide that he's causing too much damage to Russia and to themselves by his war in Ukraine. So if he were replaced through force, I would say it is almost certain that the war in Ukraine would at least be very different and would probably be ended. That, I agree with uh, his point. That's probably also the, the thing why so many people support uh, continue the war. Hmm. I just have a different view. And uh, let's see. And I hope the war will end in a better way that uh, least people die. Thank you very much for today's show recording.